بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Dear brothers and sisters uh, The topic is to talk about torch bearers I'm not going to take a lot of time because we have I think I'm here to listen to Dr. Tarek along with you uh, I consider myself a student uh, of, of Dr. Tarek and really interested to hear what he has to say just a, a few points that I'll make, and that is that you should have a strategy for your future, and you should have a strategy for how you plan to enter and engage in the community. The shelf life of an American Muslim usually is you start in Sunday school, unless you're like me, it was a different Sunday school, and then you might have converted from that Sunday school to another Sunday school. But initially you started maybe through Sunday school, through an Islamic school, then you might have joined a youth group like Mina or Maghrib or something like this, and then you went into MSA where you probably had like one of the greatest experiences of your life. Because MSA allowed you to utilize all of your potential, whether it was at a leadership level, whether it was at an educational level, level, whether it was religiously uh, uh, related to your understanding and knowledge of religion, or activism, MSA was able to fully appreciate the unique, unique skill set that you brought to the table. So it enhanced you, and you also enhanced the MSA, and that reciprocation is, is really a beautiful feeling. I loved my days in MSA. I was an MSA president. I've said it before, I bleed uh, MSA at times outside of the Sooner Crimson and Cream and the Celtic Green. <laughs> but what I would like to talk about is post-MSA, and we have post-MSA depression syndrome. And that is when you move on from the MSA, and this happened to me. You go back to communities, you have a lot of ideas. MSA is an important training ground. You interact with the groups like CARE, IMPACT, Maghreb, Zaytuna. You interact with so many different type of groups. You learn a large number of important uh, leadership qualities and strategies and how to pull off projects that you never thought you would be able to pull off over a Frappuccino. And then you move on into the communities that we have in America not to be appreciated or not to be uh, given an opportunity to participate. And I remember I had a young woman who was a student of mine who did her law degree from UC Berkeley. She's a genius. And she offered to go to a community and, and give them free advice, free legal advice. And she was told, we don't allow women to sit on our board meetings. And so she said to me, SubhanAllah, Imam Suhaib, I'm someone who people fa pay $500 an hour to sit with. And my local 501c3, who's raising money for some odd reason, doesn't want to allow me the opportunity to sit with them and share the body of work that I've been able to acquire. So what I want to do is just talk about preparing ourselves for institution building. We are in an age that requires institutions. We are not in an age that necessarily needs a superhero or a Mahdi figure. It's very unhealthy to Islam. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at times we have failed to appreciate that he did build a functioning community, a functioning institution that served at many different levels. The other issue that I want to address is that when we have problems in our community, we tend to run to the Imam. And I'm saying this as an Imam, someone who's trained in Al-Azhar and from a West African system, from the Murabitun, which is a very ancient system. I had to memorize the Ajramiya a week or so after my conversion to Islam. I couldn't even read Arabic. And Sheikh was like, Al-Kalam huwa lafzul murakkab. I was like, I don't know what that means. He's like, just, just read it. وَمَا بِتَا وَأَرِفِ الْقَدْ جُمِعَ يُكْسَرُوا فِي الْجَرِّ وَفِي نَصْبِي كَمَا I said, I don't understand what that means. He's like, no problem, just memorize it. And I memorized the whole Quran. I didn't understand Arabic. Right? And, and that, I feel, is not a healthy system of learning, by the way. But as an imam, in my contract, which I uh, submitted to Boston, and Boston graciously accepted, alhamdulillah, one of the things that was written in my contract by a lawyer, isn't it interesting that an imam would not go to another imam to write his employment agreement? I went to a lawyer, one of my old students, so I could get a pro bono. <laughs> and in the contract, it says very clearly that he does not do counseling. He is not a counselor. He doesn't fix the roof. He doesn't fix the, you know, someone's car. He is an imam. This is what an imam does. And one of the problems I feel that we have in our community is we've centralized 
And in, in some ways, we've reduced our religion to a folk figure who can handle everything. And this appeals to the nafs because it allows us to live vicariously our religious responsibility through others. So if they succeed, it's on us. But if they fail, it's on who? It's on them. And this type of outlook appeals to the heart because it does not demand responsibility. But our faith is a faith that demands seriousness. And that's why I said I don't like or appreciate the YouTube clips that make fun of acts of worship. I, I don't like it. First of all, I'm a convert to Islam, so it's something that I hold very sacred. And second, secondly, I feel that it's juvenilizing, and excuse me for inventing a word, our religious discourse to the point that it's very silly. But this is something very serious. And Allah says, Inna aradna al amanata ala samawati wal ardi wal jibari. That Allah presented distrust to the heavens and the earth, and it refused. When the Prophet asked one of his illustrious companions to recite the Quran to him, and he read, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا The Prophet began to cry. When he heard the verse that the summary is that you will be a witness against your community. He said, فَإِذَا عَيْنَاهُ تَدْرِفَانِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمُ He said his eyes were shedding tears. And he said to his community, الْقُرْآنِ حُجَّةٌ لَكْ أَوْ عَلَيْكَ The Qur'an will be a witness for you or against you. And I mentioned earlier Dickens' usage of Scrooge after he saw his co-worker in the dream and he blamed it on the gravy. He said, you are more gravy than grave. It's a beautiful play in the English language. Why? Because I want to blame it on the food. I don't want to take responsibility. But Allah said, سَنَفْرُغُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا ثَقَلًا Allah said, we will cause you two heavy ones to be judged. And the ulama said, means ins wal jinn, human beings. Because this responsibility that Allah has laid upon our shoulders is a very heavy responsibility. Secondly, the fact that shaitan has a strategy and a structure, there is a structure to evil. There is a system to evil. He's not the boogeyman who hangs out in your closet. Right? It's not the, you know, the weird jinn stories that we hear all the time. You know, I was making wudu and this arm was like 80 feet long, <laughs> shot across the sink and grabbed the soap. And it was a jinn making wudu. <laughs> Again, the attempt to reductionalism to reduce Islam as Gardner talked about to a mythological folk tale and he said something beautiful that the Islam which is best apt at facing the tidal wave of transmodernity is the dynamic Islam of the era of the Prophet alayhi salam because it has the ability structurally to encompass problems I sat in my office in Boston, and a young Puerto Rican woman came, Miranda, her name is Miranda. I asked her, do you know what is Miranda? She said, no. And it's a drink in Saudi Arabia. And she came and she said, she sat down and she said, I'm 19 years old, I'm lost, guide me. So then I explained to her, Al-Fatiha only. And she said, Imam, you people, have a responsibility to guide the youth of this country because this is the first religion I've heard that makes sense to me. Alhamdulillah, she accepted Islam. Sometimes later, and now she married a wonderful man. Two weeks ago, an Italian woman, you know, Boston, we have our share of Italians. She walks in my office with her Italian rough accent, and she said, I read about Islam. It is the only religion that makes sense of the madness. Your job, where are you people at? Who do you speak to? Where is the discourse that speaks to me as an American teenager? I gave a khutbah one time about Twilight, the, the Saturday after the movie came out in a Muslim high school. And one of the Muslim youth came to me and said, this is the first khutbah I could bring my friends to, and they would learn something from it. Now, what I want to touch on quickly is that you should consider training yourself and acquiring the necessary skills at an intellectual level to serve your community. 
and you should not restrict that to becoming a sheikh or an imam. It took me 17 years. Do you have 17 years? How many, you, you, you took your family, your entire family, and you moved to Egypt to study. You're not talking about fast food. You're talking about a process or an endeavor. So I would encourage you now, first quality is to develop a strategy for your future. And ask yourself, what can I contribute in the broadest sense of the word to the growth and development of Islam as it begins to work its way through the fabric of this society? And that's why I have a student now who's memorizing Quran. Do you know what I told him to do? I told him, stop memorizing Quran. He said, why? I said, I want you to go do something right now, which for me, you need to do it for this institution in Boston. He said, what? Go volunteer for the Obama campaign. I said, I excuse you for the next three or four months. Go learn community development from the best of the best. And then come back and help us at Al Khalan. He said, Imam, I want to memorize Quran. I said, Inshallah, we will memorize Quran. But now go learn community organization. Go and canvas for a campaign. Every mosque in America at a local and national level should have a brother and a sister who volunteer to canvas for a campaign, even Romney's campaign. May Allah forgive us all. <laughs> Sorry. There's no need to clap. Dr. Tark doesn't like clapping, <laughs> right? Because you know why? He thinks it juvenilizes the discourse, and it's true. So you can say takbir, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, that's fine. But even that, where you're able to volunteer at some level, because our community does not have the resources to teach you that. We have to be honest. In many ways, we do not have the resources or the structure to offer solutions to the problems that we have, and this leads us to frustration. And we have very lofty goals, very lofty goals. But if we are not structurally prepared to address those goals in a realistic fashion, then we're in trouble. And I'll give you an example. How do we fundraise? We corral people in a room. We yell at them for about an hour. And we just hope it rains. <laughs> I went to a fundraising workshop sponsored by a brother uh, Farhan, who, who studied at Harvard, and he actually showed me the methods of fundraising. The least effective way of fundraising is to corral people in a room and scream at them. <laughs> Americans give more than $300 billion in charity a year. And studies show that the worst way to raise money is the way that we do it. That doesn't mean that we should laugh because, again, we're reducing ourselves. But I said, subhanAllah, we have to change our discourse. We have to change the nomenclature wheel of how we run our institutions. Here's one person, Farhan Hafizahullah, who took the time to go and do a master's in how to develop a 501c3 at Harvard. And now he's, in one workshop, changed our entire method of how we look at fundraising as a community. So what I want to encourage you to do, and I don't, have, I don't like long, drawn-out speeches, and I would love to see in the future more of a, of a reciprocation process where we were sharing discussions. I think discussions are much more effective and much more healthier than just talking. But what I would encourage you to do are the following. Number one, understand that your contribution is vital. Take it seriously. No matter what you are, poet, artist, athlete, imam, sheikh, teacher, lawyer, doctor, community relations, political science. You have George Washington University down, right, right down the street. But do that with the niyyah to serve God in community. The prophet, peace be upon him, as Ashatibi mentions something very beautiful, that people would come to the prophet and say, what is the best action to do? And the prophet would say, be good to your parents. The prophet would say, to give charity to someone else, to make jihad to someone else, to study to someone else. And Ashatabi said that the mufti yura'i, that the one who's giving the answer, looks after the state of the people to see what's best for themselves and ultimately what's best 
for their community, which will be inshallah ultimately best for them in the hereafter. The Prophet utilized talented people and he put them in the right place. Who heard, who was it that saw the adhan in his dream? There were two people. Most people don't even know their names. One was Omar, but neither of them made the adhan because they don't have nice voices. The Prophet found people, that dude can blow, make the adhan. He can sing, he has a nice set of tools, make the adhan. The Prophet utilizes the right people for the right job. This takes me into the last point, and this is all I want to say. That our relationship with our imams and our teachers has to change. I have a, a, a very dear friend of mine. I don't call him a student. He studies with me, but I consider him a dear friend. Muhammad Haq from Queens. Bengali from Queens. Holding it down. And recently we had a meeting. And he said something that differed than what I said. You know? I saw him the next day after Salah, and he came to me and he said, are, are you mad at me? Are you upset? Are you angry? I said, why? He said, because I challenged you. I said, no, I love you for challenging me. I love you for challenging me. You know why? Because if you trust me, you will challenge me. If you trust me, you will question me. And if I trust you, it's not going to damage my ego. I was sitting with my teacher from Senegal once. We were reading a classical book. And he said, فَقَدْ جَاءَ زَيْدًا مِنْ بَيْتْ أَبِيهِ جَاءَ زَيْدًا So I said, Shaykh, it's جَاءَ زَيْدٌ The fa'il, marfu' And then I said, it's the subject that has u, it's not the object, a. Uh. And everyone in our halaqa said, <gasps> Suhaib will be eviscerated now. <laughs> and the Shaykh was a very big man and he, he became quiet. And he looked up, and everyone got scared. I started to get nervous. And then he said, this is the happiest day of my life, Shaykh, that my student corrected me. He said, I ask Allah to bear witness that what I taught him empowered him to serve me too. So the relationship, and I, I'm deeply concerned about a medieval articulation of relationship between student and teacher, which did have its place which may not necessarily work in this day of ours, especially for converts. We fought the Catholics because of that. Real talk. In the South, it's not going to work in certain areas of the South. We are very, very staunch, were very, very staunch Protestants. So to bring back a priest class understanding of religion, and I've seen this, is in some cases for new Muslims, debilitating. One of my best friends left Islam because of his interaction with someone who did not want to be a teacher, but wanted to be basically his own personal Bashar al-Assad. Seriously, to the point he told him to divorce his wife. And he said, if you don't divorce your wife, then you have lost your spiritual maqam. This is a friend of mine. So I had to tell him, yo, man, you belong to a cult. And he said, you know, you're off the wrong path. How could you call this a cult? Where is he now? But what should happen is imams, and I, I say this again because I'm from boss town. And that is that the model that we have tried to employ with our ED there from, Bo from Washington, D.C., Brother Atif Hardin, and also Yusufi, who graduated from Princeton, uh, who's there now, and others, was that we adopt a federated approach as an institution. And I will say this very, very clearly. The most important thing on your plate right now after your individual relationship with your Lord is how can you contribute to building a healthy institution locally. Do not get caught up in conspiracy theories. Illuminati. You want to get illuminated, pray Fajr. <laughs> no, seriously. Because these are all ways to divert your awlawiyat. And in this situation, if you're going to live in this country and be part of this country, and to be critical of this country, you have to contribute to institutions that can legitimately serve the needs of Muslims. Earlier this morning, we had a topic about happiness. I said, happiness for who? 
What makes you happy might not make converts happy. Converts, how many times have we even heard our parents prayed for on the mimbar on Fridays? How many times have we heard someone pray that God will guide our mothers and fathers? That he will guide our brothers and our sisters? That he will guide our family members? That he'll guide us? Because it's hard when you convert. You, convict, you basically commit social suicide when you convert in this country. You lose wearing a seersucker and start to wear a shawar kameez. Real talk. So happiness for who? Happiness has to be institutionalized. What about a divorcee who's 30 years old and culturally told she will never be married again? She has been sentenced to a life of perpetual loneliness in our community. Do you think she's going to be happy to see Father's and Mother's Day in the masjid? That's not going to make her happy. That's going to remind her of her plight. So I said early this morning, happiness, this is kind of a red herring discussion. It's sloganeering. We need to understand the needs of our community in order to make them happy. And Imam Ibn Hajib, rahimahullah, and his mukhtasar, as I said before, was criticized by the majority of the Malikis who said that emotions are indeed a component of the maslaha that should be achieved for the ummah. Not only should the ummah be praying, but they should be praying in a state of happiness, not depression. And we have simplified our understanding. So talk about happiness. What about, I met today a woman who lost her husband. How can we contribute to her overall happiness? So for me, I'm tired of it, man. I'm tired of it. I want to see healthy, strong institutions built that serve people properly. The marriage crisis continues because we have not approached it from an institutional perspective. And don't ask the imam to save your marriage. I can destroy it for you. But let's find people who are qualified. So that's what I did when I got to Boston the first two weeks. And these are questions that I received by people who were not from Boston. Ajib, one woman came from another state. Why? She's sexually abused by her father. Can you imagine? We're going to tell her pray and fast, and she's living a, a life of, of sexual abuse at home? And then I have to call downtown. Am I legally obligated to turn this weird freak in? And then she runs away from home and calls me. Imam, is it halal for me to marry without a wali? You know, the crisis that she went through. I had another instance of a person who was being physically abused. Another of a girl who became bulimic because she watched the Kardashians too much. No, real talk. Another of a man who was addicted to pornography. Most of these people are not from Boston. Wallahi, one of them drove three or four hours. A convert who came and said, I have converted to Islam and I belong to a cult that my father is head of. And if I wear hijab and begin to pray, I might be physically harmed. Now, what I realized quick, because I had been out of the imam game for almost 12 years, is that I was ill-equipped to handle those problems. Ezhar did not afford me the opportunity to understand what Piaget and Erickson would have said about this abused person. So immediately I began to scramble in my community and to look for people who were qualified. And I began to look for you here, you young people, you who have the talent and the training that could help inform these people and save, in some cases, their faith. Everyone in our community doesn't suffer from a problem of aqidah. Many people in our community suffer from social, emotional, financial, and physical problems, which we are ill-equipped to handle as imams. But you are very well-versed to handle as young professionals. Now you're going to say, but I don't know qala Allah and qala Rasulullah. Good, let's work together. I'll give you qala Allah, qala Rasulullah, and you give me qala Piaget. And subhanAllah, I sent out, maybe some of you saw the flyer with the bat symbol for the khutbah in Juma In Boston, I said, the symbol is out. And instead of the bat, we had the mosque above the Boston skyline. And subhanAllah. And I have a third issue, but I don't have time. And that is talking down to you. Speaking to you as though you're evil and doomed. 
the theology, the apocalyptic theology is not a healthy theology for our community. How could you be, be depressed? And how could you be sad if you are from the ummah of Sayyid al-Awwaleen wal-Akhirin? How is that possible when you have been afforded spiritual capital by being associated to the Prophet if you utilize it properly? I put out the alarm and 40 physicians showed up tomorrow. 40. Everyone from Masors, we have Muslim Masors, so now in Boston we, we live in the hood, Roxbury. We are very proud of Roxbury. We love Roxbury. And we don't say we live in the hood because we are trying to be tough or hard, but we just love our neighbors. My neighbor calls me Imam, like iPad. <laughs> so, Assalamu Imam. So, I'm not your mama. <laughs> but can you imagine a single parent mother coming home off the tee, those of you from Boston? walks by the masjid and sees a sign, free massages. I got six kids at home, man, that massage gonna work. And then she goes home and turns on the news. Muslims are terrorists. No, they're not, they're mama sore. <laughs> because the outcome of a healthy institution is practical results. One of my teachers told me in the College of Education, for any lesson plan to truly be successful, you have to be able to evaluate it. You have to be able to think about thinking. We think, but we don't think about thinking. So 40 physicians showed up. Everyone from mental health physician, internal medicine, uh, weight loss advice, everything under the sun. And we chose a convert sister, Sarah King, to head that institution. And now when people come to my office, and it is quite frequent. And this is not to say Boston is full of people that have problems. So I know there's people in Boston, they're like, I'm never going to this office, man. <laughs> They'll make a chuppah about me or something. <laughs> we get phone calls from as far as France. And what I'm doing now with people who their problem is not explicitly religious in nature, and it needs some type of medical service, we have a referral service to our physicians. And people's needs are being met. Now imagine if we were to do that, replicate that at all other levels. The financial operations of, of our community, we should have a walk. In Boston now we have a walk for almost $24 million. Why? Because people who went to Kennedy Business School play Fajr. And they ask us, how do you raise money here? We corral people <laughs> and we scream at them. And they give us their money. <laughs> and we let them go home with some, you know, jacked up chicken tikka. <laughs> and then it's good. And these five or six brothers came and said, and sisters, this is the worst way to raise money. And they changed the entire attitude of the community. So what I would encourage you to do is to utilize your talents, have an individual relationship with your Lord and be more busy with building institutions that are going to serve this society. Reflecting Islamic ethics implicitly, not explicitly. We don't have to stamp Islam on everything we do. Let people infer your beauty. Let them infer what you have to offer. I, I just went to legal seafood dressed like this. And the waitress, we were very nice to her. Not too nice, but nice. My wife is watching. And then she said, what do you do? I said, I'm an, I'm an imam. Dress like that? I said, yeah, I'm an imam. Your hair like that? I'm an imam. I said, that's all right. That's, that's good. That instance of just slowly trying to build a healthy relationship, a contributive relationship to our community can be done at so many levels. The problem with Islamophobia is that we need to meet it head on structurally. It is a well-organized, well-oiled machine. In Boston alone, they spent $42 million to make sure we couldn't build our mosque. $42 million? They are structural in their approach. The attack on you some years ago was a structured attack. 
It wasn't simply, let's write some articles, okay, mash, whoever wants to write one, khalas, imshi ala tukid, uktub. There was a structural approach. There also needs to be a structural response. And that's why, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the association of professors, I believe, were more effective in repelling the attack of the Islamophobes than we were, correct? ACLU. ACLU. Why? Because they rebuttaled it with what? With a structured approach, not just emotion. So I don't have a lot to say, except your relationship with Allah has to be strong. And that's negotiated. We all struggle. We're up and down. Number two, continue to do well in your education. Continue to study hard. Continue to succeed. And then have the eye of contributing back to some degree to our communities to create structural goodness that marries the sciences that you study. Qala Piaget and Qala Erikson. With Qala Allah wa Qala Malik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.